Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ceres Power Holdings PLC for Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded meeting, investors online will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions at any time and press send. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll, and if you give that uh, your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. I'd now like to hand over to the management team from Ceres Power, Phil, Eric, Elizabeth, good morning. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the full year results presentation. I'm joined by Eric Lakin, CFO, and by Elizabeth Skerritt, Head of IR. And we just want to talk you through um, last year's results and also give you an update on uh, company strategy for, for this year. So without further ado, let's move on. Um, so what we're facing, I think, now at Ceres is actually a very strong outlook for 2024. Um, 2023 uh, had had some challenges, but actually, if you look at where the company is uh, right now, we're in we're in good shape, um, both on the current SOFC business and also into the acceleration of the SOEC business, which was a big strategic decision we took several years ago, and is starting to actually pay dividends. So, in summary, um, what we've achieved in the last uh, last 12 months. Um, we see progress with Bosch on the power units uh, that they're developing, backed up with 160 million euros of EU funding. Um, we've got a lot of exciting progress at Doosan with the factory build um, in South Korea, 50 megawatt factory. And actually during this presentation, we'll actually give you a, a video insight into that factory being built, which is fantastic. And that's on schedule for commissioning. Um, our relationship with Wei Chai remains very strong, and we're actually developing larger power units now, 75 kilowatt stationary power units. So we'll give you an update on Wei Chai. Um, technically, there's a lot going on. We've developed our next generation of stack technology, which is a larger footprint stack, higher power density uh, to really scale as we go into modular sizes of tens of kilowatts to hundreds of kilowatts to megawatts, and ultimately for SOEC into hundreds of megawatts to gigawatt scale. Um, to that point, um, we're making very good progress on our first megawatt scale demonstrator, which is now on site with Shell in Bangalore in India. And we ended the, the year with a, a, a strong cash position and a growing pipeline of commercial partners. So that's where we got to at the end of 2023. Many of you will be aware that we were um, progressing on a new license deal towards the end of last year. That actually came in in the first few weeks of 2024, and that was with Delta Electronics, a really exciting partnership for us. Anybody that knows Taiwan and knows Delta, um, fantastic manufacturer uh, servicing the TMT market. And what that deal meant for us is a license deal of 43 million. Uh, for technology transfer, most notably, not just for SOFC, but also for SOEC. So our first licensee in the EC space, which is, I think, um, a, a strong validation of our, of our strategy because it's only a few years since we actually formally started moving into the electrolysis space. And also somebody that can, again, scale at pace. So they're targeting uh, initial production by the end of 2026. And so we're getting pretty good at building these factories at pace. Uh, if you think about Bamberg in Germany, think about uh, Doosan in South Korea, and now Delta, what we are building at Ceres is a global footprint of uh, manufacturing capability at scale. So I think uh, 2024 will, will be a, a, a strong year, as I've said, for the company, and we'll give you updates throughout the year on commercial progress. But that's a brief introduction from myself. What I will do now is hand you over to Eric to actually talk you through the financial performance of 2023, and then we'll come back to the business strategy after that. So, Eric. Great. Thanks, Phil. Um, well, first of all, apologies for the delay in the publication of our results for the financial year 2023. Um, as we informed the market in mid-March, uh, the auditors informed us they needed more time to complete the audit, the exercise is now complete. Um, we are now a main market listed company. As a result, uh, we are designated as a public interest entity. There is even more scrutiny from the auditor and the auditor regulator on our accounts. Uh, so it's been a very thorough process. 
It also involved going back to historical treatment of certain revenue contracts and other items, including dilapidations provision. And we have made certain uh, prior period adjustments, uh, which are explained in more detail in note one to the accounts. So with that, let's move on to the uh, financial summary for the year. Overall, uh, the results are consistent with the guidance that we gave in the January trading update uh, with uh, revenue at the top end of the range given uh, and uh, of 22.3 million. Uh, that uh, um, reflects an increase on the prior year um, owing to progress with our commercial partners as they move towards industrialization um, of stack supply and scale manufacture. Margin improvement to 61% reflects the revenue increase. Also, in fact, there's a reduction in the, the warranty provision uh, and uh, relates to the, the mix of revenue as well. Uh, the gross profit uh, increase reflects the revenue increase and, and, um, uh, and the margin improvement as well. Uh, and the adjusted EBITDA uh, loss of 50.3 million is an increase on prior year, which was 45.7 million. And that reflects an increased invest planned investment, uh, particularly in SOEC, uh, but also uh, improvement in our SOFC technology, as Phil also mentioned earlier. We finished the year with a very strong cash position of 140 million pounds, again, as guided uh, in January. And the cash burn of 42.4 million is a significant reduction from the 67.3 million in the prior year. And in fact, 2022, uh, we believe reflects a peak uh, cash burn for the business uh, and uh, the cash outflow uh, for 2023 reflects a continued discipline around cash and cost management, particularly as an economic environment. And in particular in the year, there was a reduction in working capital of around 10 million pounds relates to trade receivables and also inventory and also a reduction in the uh, tax debtor uh, through in the year. The order backlog of 64.2 um, million pounds is reduction from the prior year period of 71.1 million. And that reflects the revenue recognition and the fact that we didn't actually sign a new licensed partner. So there wasn't a significant new order intake in the year to offset the revenue uh, recognized in the year. But obviously that, that situation changes or changed in January this year uh, with, the, um, with the contracting with Delta. Uh, Headcounts of 591. Again, it's a modest increase, uh, a much reduced increase from prior year periods. Uh, we now believe we've got critical mass, importantly across the business, uh, whether that's engineering, materials science, um, commercial te uh, technicians, uh, and we would not expect any uh, headcount growth uh, this year. In terms of revenue, uh, trends over the last four years uh, and gross margin. Uh, it's been, um, again, the, the, the margin development is a combination of revenue mix, actual revenue, so overheads, um, factory cost absorption. And um, we've got modest revenue growth in 23. Um, but more interestingly, looking forward, we've given guidance that we uh, anticipate revenue in 2024. We approximately double that of 2023. And that's just based on the existing uh, order backlog and, and contracts signed. Um, obviously, any additional contracts signed entered into in the year, um, subject to revenue recognition timing, uh, could represent upside to that to that guidance. In terms of the mix. Uh, Many of you will be familiar with the different revenue streams, but just as a reminder, uh, and for those that are new to the business, we've currently got three different revenue streams. Um, so license fees in, in yellow there, that is a very high margin, can be 100% margin, which can be recognized upfront or over time, depending whether it's a, a right to use or right to access a recognition of license fees. And that can be um, through initial technology transfer, such as what we're undergoing currently with Delta this year, or it can be an ongoing sort of annual development license, uh, which we currently have with uh, Bosch and Doosan, for example. Uh, supply represents 
providing uh, prototype hardware or components to enable our partners to develop uh, systems uh, and also to support their um, the factory developments. So that's a lower margin, and um, that's provision of our uh, of our stacks and cells that come out of our our CP2 uh, facility in Red Hill. Engineering services is associated with the development license I mentioned earlier, and that's joint development collaboration uh, with partners um, to support uh, their activities. Can either be um, preparing factories for for commissioning or developing systems, and we have that with multiple partners at the moment. Again, that's that sort of lower margin uh, business, uh, was an important part of of getting ready for uh, uh, for ultimately for stack production uh, and. Um, and uh, commercial launch. The, fi the final segment we don't yet have is royalties. That's longer term. Again, that'll be high margin, if not 100% margin revenue from partners. And that's based on when a stack is sold commercially, uh, we get a royalty from that or a system if we have a systems license. So ultimately that requires a stack to be, uh, to be um, manufactured, uh, installed into a system and sold to a third party for commercial uh, commercial use, and that's the point at which uh, we get royalties from that. As we've guided previously, we're not expecting any royalties this year. We uh, anticipate it starts at some point in next year, particularly from Doosan. Crucially, we've got, uh, again, significant planned uh, investment in R&D, a uh, significant part of our overall cost base. It's important to continue to innovate remain competitive and support our, our partners. Um, so the R&D investment overall increased 11% to 54 million uh, last year. And that includes investment, ongoing investment in fuel cells, including developing uh, and testing the next generation of fuel cells, but also increasingly investment in um, SOEC technology. That cost incorporates the uh, design and build uh, of the one megawatt containerized system, which is now in situ in Bangalore, but also now in, uh, investment in the next uh, stack array module, which is more of a commercial pilot that is a modular repeatable unit that demonstrates the ability to get to 100 megawatts plus, as Phil mentioned earlier. Um, and the capital investment uh, is, uh, is, is generally uh, more to term programs that includes uh, investment in test stand infrastructure and the uh, capability of our pilot plant in Red Hill. And again, that the facility there has evolved to, to now manufacture uh, the second generation fuel cells for the first time uh, in recent months. Um, overall, we anticipate the investment to plateau for this year. So we're not expecting any material growth in operating costs or indeed Cap, capex or cap, capitalized uh, development um, and that's same for r d we've got sort of critical mass and we expect the current um, cost base to 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 um to be similar this year uh, even taking to into account inflation as again we look to costs and focus on the priority programs in terms of Cash burn, you can see from uh, this uh, chart here, it shows the last four years, this is uh, total cash, uh, effectively cash on cash movement, cash being for the full description, including cash equivalents, short-term or long-term investments. Uh, and it re reduced significantly last year, uh, supported by uh, the reduction in working capital. Uh, and we, we anticipate looking forward, uh, as noted here in the final bullet, on an underlying basis, um, in, based on adjusted EBITDA less, less capital investment, so CapEx and capitalized development to materially re uh, reduce uh, this year on account of revenue growth and therefore um, reduced EBITDA losses based on a consistent cost base. Um, we will not, it's worth noting, we won't have the same benefit as we had last year of a significant reduction in working capital. That's a, that's a one-off benefit, uh, but we do expect an underlying basis to show uh, improvement And uh, with that, I'll hand back over to Phil. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just give you an update on the, the business strategy going forwards. And really what we're looking to do is an acceleration now of our commercial offering for the SOEC platform built on the leadership that we've established in SOFC. Um, 
and and don't forget what we've now got is production supply chains globally for the same core technology for FC, which we're now able to very rapidly deploy onto EC. So that's quite a compelling, um, quite a compelling offering in the market. And there's really three things that we're focused on: the commercial acceleration, uh, licensing the technology, which requires maintaining technology leadership, and execution, execution at pace. Um, on the commercial acceleration, we'll, we can talk a little bit more about this, but we think we have a, a very compelling business case for this technology across green hydrogen, particularly for industrial decarbonization in the sectors such as green steel, green ammonia, and synthetic fuels and future fuels. And commercially, we're engaging across the full hydrogen value train, chain to drive demand for that technology. So that means we engage with end users like Shell. We also engage with you know, manufacturing partners like the ones we have and, and new ones like Delta. And that's really building out that commercial ecosystem. So that's been a big focus for the company over the past 12 months. Um, on the technology leadership, um, as we've mentioned, the second generation stack's now been released and is being starting to be produced in uh, our facilities in CP2 and Red Hill. And we've developed that in collaboration with industrial partners such as Bosch. Um, we're also spending a lot of time on the electrolyzer module side Actually, what we will show is the, the first megawatt scale demonstrator with Shell. But we realized that our target really is hundreds of megawatts to gigawatts of deployment. So already we're developing larger modularized systems in that five to 10 megawatt kind of range that can then be scaled to hundreds of megawatts and gigawatts uh, stage deployment. And then execution at pace. When we think about execution at Ceres, we think not just about what we're doing within our facilities here in the UK, but we think about what's happening with our partners. We work in collaboration uh, very much with a global focus. So our partnerships in Germany, Korea and Taiwan are now scaling production. And that's really the fundamental bedrock for the company. To support that, it's not just about the core cell technology. We're also able to now offer factory blueprints. So how do we actually enable people to go to market faster and you see as we do these factory builds they're actually getting shorter so that the delta timeline is is shorter again probably than what we've seen previously but that's building on a the benefits of the light the licensing model and the supply chains that we've built out and also the fact that we're getting pretty good at this in terms of you know what we've learned at red hill what we've done in in germany and korea we can now apply to, to new partners as they come on so execution at pace is a key pillar for us and as you may be aware, uh, one of the unique features of solid oxide is it is a truly reversible technology. So that means all the investments we've made on the power system side, we still take that through the fuel cell side in terms of distributed power, uh, data centers, some of the applications like maritime. But now when you run that in reverse, we open up these huge new markets, green steel, green ammonia, future fuels. And that's without a, a, a significant reinvestment in core technology. That is basically capitalizing on the core attributes of the technology and the investments we've already made. And hence, that's one of the reasons why to prosecute this market, we're not expecting to have to significantly grow our, our cost base at all. As Eric said, we're now at a critical mass. But what we see here is commercial upside from, from what we've already established. In terms of the technology advantage, a very quick reminder of why this technology is unique. Um, it's based on ferritic steels, which basically means it's a low cost solid oxide technology. We use very common uh, ceramic rare earth materials such as Syria. That's where the company got its name from. And our operating temperature is very uh, appealing when you come to actually building our balance of systems and even balance of plants for hydrogen. In terms of costs, you know, Syria costs a thousand of, of the cost of platinum, um, 70,000 of iridium. In fact, for electrolysis, we don't even need iridium or, or some of the PGM kind of materials. And therefore, fundamentally, we have a next generation technology that is very, very competitive versus anything else that's out there in the solid oxide space, addressing these huge market opportunities. And when we talk about delivery, we have a mature stack design based on years and years of development and uh, testing, et cetera, at Ceres for, 
for first of all for fuel cell but now for electrolysis combine that also with the supply chain and the manufacturing uh, capability to a very high standards i think when you look at the partnerships that we we develop at Ceres, we don't come up with partnerships every week but when we do actually sign new license deals the quality of the partners that we sign are world-class people who demand very high standards in terms of performance quality supply chain and that's why we're very confident in our ability to build out the scale for this company and then obviously moving into the the markets for electrolysis we're able to actually develop the the system approach just as we've done on the fuel cell side as well and going back to partner scaling globally what you can start to see is the footprint establishing so obviously bosch is a key partner for us in germany uh, Doosan in South Korea, uh, now uh, Delta in, in Taiwan, and also Wei Chai uh, in China. Wei Chai remains a very uh, important partner for us. Um, at the turn of the year, we made it clear we don't now expect the three way joint venture between ourselves, Bosch, and Wei Chai necessarily to be executed in the, in the way it was originally planned. However, I do expect that we'll be able to move forwards both with our partners. Um, Bosch separately and, and Wei Chai. And also with Wei Chai, I expect that we'll have more to say commercially in terms of how that partnership progresses. So all of our partnerships remain very strong. And really this modular scaling approach um, is starting to pay off. So with Doosan, you may have seen they're developing, first of all, we developed uh, 10 kilowatt systems that's been scaled to 60 kilowatts and now 600 kilowatts those kind of systems are required for commercial scale deployment and, and some of their applications such as in shipping, et cetera. Uh, with Bosch, there's a lot of activity on the, the piloting of these systems in various different locations and different applications. And if you go on Bosch's SOFC website, you'll see highlighted some of those applications like data centers, like hospitals, et cetera. And that's really from tens of kilowatts to hundreds of kilowatts kind of deployment. And as I mentioned uh, with Wei Chai, we're scaling that to 75 kilowatts. And again, that enables us to get towards megawatt scale of power generation. So that's all on the fuel cell side of the business. Obviously, you can now add to that Delta as well. And they'll be developing, again, systems of, of a similar kind of modularity to this. I'd like to just take a few seconds to show you uh, the, the factory build of, in South Korea, because very often people are familiar with Sarah's and they've got an idea of what we do here in Horsham and here in Red Hill. But this is actually um, a video of the, the uh, factory, the 50 megawatt SOFC factory, which could also be deployed into EC, Semanjam in, in South Korea. So again, this is a greenfield site, very impressive in terms of uh, the, the build out of this. And also there is land around this site as well for, for future expansion as well. Um, we've got teams there right now supporting first commissioning of stacks coming off these lines and, and we expect that to become um, fully commissioned in the second half of this year and then as Eric says that ties in with, with product development and then we'd expect royalties from this uh, in the second half probably of 2025. But it, again what we're laying here is very solid foundations for scale uh, for this company. And again, in the future, we'll be able to show you similar kind of um, build outs, if you like, as we as we sign more partners. So that's really, I think, uh, for anybody that's uh, at some point may be able to see this, you have single piece, very impressive, state of the art, highly automated factory using localized Asian supply chain, bringing in more supply chain partners than, than originally we've, we've done so far in Europe. And I think this is a great example of how we're scaling the business globally. And that brings us on to uh, the new partnership with Delta, which is a dual license for both power generation and for uh, electrolysis for green hydrogen. Um, it's a big endorsement, as I mentioned earlier, of the of the strategy to invest in electrolysis. And you saw from the, the cash profile that Eric talked about earlier, we have been in an investment mode over the past few years. That was very deliberate because we, 
we raised significant capital to move into EC. We've been deploying that. I would say that deployment phase is, is largely over in terms of the, the peak cash investment we've made. But what's important now is we're starting to see the commercial partnership starting to form as well. So for me, I am absolutely delighted with the progress that we've made on electrolysis because we've laid out the strategy, uh, we've, we've developed the technology, and now we're actually signing world-class partnerships in this. Um, when you go to somewhere like Taiwan, these guys are based directly off opposite TSMC. You know, the, the manufacturing capability, the ambition is, is huge. And they're not just a, a Taiwanese company. They have operations in India, in Thailand, all across Southeast Asia. So very exciting partnership uh, with Delta. Moving on to a little bit of a focus on the electrolyzer side of the business. Why are we so convinced of the electrolysis uh, offering from, from Ceres? Well, building on all those foundations, uh, building on the manufacturing, building on the supply chain, we have a very compelling commercial proposition here, which is just because of the way solid oxide works, uh, we offer a, about a 25% or more uh, high, um, increase in efficiency uh, for green hydrogen. So what that means is about a 25% reduction in capex and a 25% reduction in opex, particularly where you can combine it with heat, and that's for the industrial decarbonization uh, applications, particularly green steel, green ammonia, and synthetic fuels. And that's why some of our first partners like Shell are very interested in this. It tends to be the industrial decarbonization side of things. And there's some, some numbers here just indicative. So if your best in class low temperature alkali or PEM is about 50 kilowatt hours per kilo, uh, we only need 37 kilowatt hours of electricity to produce a kilo, kilogram of hydrogen. So on a million tons a year of hydrogen basis, instead of six gigawatts, you, you need less than five of electrolyzer capacity. Instead of 12 gigawatts of upstream renewables, you need less than nine. And from your electricity cost, you're saving about 25% a year. So it is a, a big shift uh, in terms of the current technology that's out there and, and actually the potential of solid oxide. And I think you can see this right across the industry now. Solid oxide is now getting to a stage of maturity where a lot of companies are now seriously considering they need solid oxide in their portfolio. And because of our licensing model and our technology leadership, a natural place to come for that technology is Ceres. This is all about scale. Um, we've been working with Atkins Realis, uh, formerly SC Lavalin, over the past year or so. And we've been conducting front-end uh, engineering design for multi-megawatt modularized systems that can scale into 100 megawatt building blocks and then into gigawatts. Um, and really, you know, it's quite a compelling combination because we're able to offer factory blueprints to how do you build, you know, gigafactories and also how do you actually deploy this in chemical plants uh, at that scale. Um, that's a big part of what we're doing now. And we are also developing modules, which are a larger, a larger scale module. So building on the factory, uh, the, the technology team is very focused on scaling uh, the module size, which can then go into the, the 100 megawatt kind of building blocks into a hydrogen plant for these, these end applications that we see before us. And I, I you know, we'll probably give technology update on that uh, probably towards the middle of the year, but progress on that is, is very, very uh, impressive, I would say. So uh, just to give a, an outlook and a, a focus for the year ahead, um, you know, start with the end point. I'm very confident we're going to at least double revenues this year. Um, and we will update guidance as and when we sign new commercial partnerships. Um, so we're not going to give that guidance here today, but I think already with what we, we have in front of us, we know we're, we're on for a strong 2024. And I actually think that we will have more to say on commercial partnerships this year. Um, Bosch, Doosan and Delta are all progressing towards scale. And that's really the foundations of the company. Um, we're continuing to grow the relationship with Weichai and expect to have more to say about that this year. Um, our demonstrator programs for green hydrogen are on track. Uh, the electrolyzer is now 
on site in Bangalore in India, and we're moving forwards with Bosch and Linde on other demonstrations as we develop these mod this modular approach. Um, we started well with the, the Delta deal, and that's, that's one of a, a number of opportunities that we're, we're now seeing for the electrolysis side. I've talked about the relationship with uh, Atkins Realis on how do we scale this, uh, and we are engaged right across the value chain for hydrogen um, as a building block for gigawatt scale plants. Um, and I think we're, we're looking forward to a very uh, strong 2024 after you know, what was something of a challenge in 2023. But I think that the, the foundations that we laid last year and the commercial progress that we expect uh, will see us have a good 2024. So with that, I think we can hand over to the questions. Great, Phil, Eric, thank you very much indeed. Um, Elizabeth, you can see you've got a number of questions from investors online. So thank you to everybody for your engagement. But before we perhaps turn to those, if I could hand the mic to anyone that has a question in the room. Hi, uh, Chris Lennon from Credit Suisse. Sorry, yes, still on uh, autopilot on that stuff. Uh, looking at the the potential opportunities you've just spoken about there, Phil, and, and commentary maybe you gave in January, saying that you're, you're confident of another deal. On the electrolyzer side, those new opportunities uh, or, or partner potential opportunities, how, how many are brand new customers potentially into the uh, technology or how, how many are maybe expansions from partnerships you already have um i i don't really want to give too much forecasts on this because i think in the current markets we're not really rewarded for forecasting it's kind of used as a bit of a okay have you hit that or not but what i would say is in electrolysis obviously it opens up the market to new entrants such as we've seen with delta um it also makes sense that if you have invested several hundred million into a facility and a supply chain that can make solid oxide cells and let's call them cells from not fc or ec then you would want to be able to capitalize on that investment and deploy that so we're working on both fronts basically new partnerships and also uh, our existing partners are of course uh, very important to us so that's also an opportunity for us as well and a second question, but there's been a lot of interest in the market around data centers recently. I just wondered if you guys were seeing any momentum on, on, on that side of the market, looking at commentary from Bloom Energy, speaking a lot about the, the potential for greenfield uh, data centers and using solar oxide fuel cells for, for that end market. Yeah, we um, on that particular one, that's why I think the Delta uh, relationship is, is a really interesting one because they are already servicing that part of the market you know they have relationships with the big data center and tmt kind of customers uh globally and i think that's a big part of their strategy their product uh, strategy is they see that data center market as, as key um and i think it depends on where you are in the world as well i mean what we're seeing on the fuel cell side is probably our biggest our biggest demand for growth is probably in the asian market and i think that's why we're starting to see some of these partnerships forming as well so so yes to, to answer your question i think there's a there's still a big market opportunity there and i think that it depends on our partners focus but i think with delta that's a big part of their strategy hi um three questions uh the first one was in your kind of commercial review you know you talked about asia being perhaps the sort of key area for potential new interest and mentioned China and India. So I wanted to say is China is all about Wei Chai or potentially it's other things. And, you know, is there anything to say about sort of the subsidy and kind of support regime in other Asian markets that's relevant? And the second couple of questions are more for Eric. You know, we're used to perhaps modeling the gross margin based on that mix of the different kinds of revenues. Actually, those, the, the, the columns for 22 and 23 look pretty much identical and yet the gross margin went up just sort of um which is welcome obviously but uh, some explanation on that and actually the other one was just on um returns on cash because we've got used to them not being any so uh i need to th have a think about you know what what you earn on the cash deposits thanks okay. oh sorry ken rump from good body if i didn't say that at the beginning okay so if we talk a little bit about the first question about Asia, 
Um, our relationship with Wei Chai is focused on fuel cell. And uh, obviously, they're uh, a, a very important strategic partner for us. So, so that's our, our near term focus. Um, that doesn't exclude other partnerships in the future, but that's not something I'm I'm really in a position to give any any updates on at this point. To be to be quite honest, um, you mentioned India. Um, we're seeing big subsidies in in, <laughs> in regions like India. I act, I actually expect China will probably also probably in the next five year plan go big on some of these areas as well, like green hydrogen. We're seeing subsidies in, you already have it in South Korea, you're seeing it in places like Japan, um, even Taiwan. So I think regionally, there's a lot of national policies that are starting to um, prime the pump, if you like, for, for interest. So I think at the moment, when we look at some of these markets, say India, it's very much focused on low cost um, solutions. So right now, low cost Chinese electrolyzers and the market for that is Alclive in India. But I think in the future, because of the economic um, benefits of this, you'll start to see EC also come, come forwards. And that technology really hasn't been commercialized yet in any of those regions. So I think near term, we have a focus on Wei Chai but, um, and existing partners. But beyond that, we see upside in terms of new partnerships. Okay, great. So in terms of, Kent, in terms of the, um margin development I mean, there's three things that affect uh, gross margin one is the mix as you pointed out two is the absolute amount of revenue which impacts the absorption of, of uh, factory overheads and third is sort of other uh, the improvement um, from 22 to 23 uh, was really the second two categories so in absolute terms revenue increased by two and a half million uh, so uh, even with the same mix you're going to have uh, an improved absorption of, uh, of of factory costs, which improves margin. Uh, and the other um, category, uh, actually the warranty provision in the year reduced uh, by around 600K, um, and uh, 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 which has also actually had uh, a meaningful increase in the percentage of gross margin. And the reason for that reduction is we've got better infill data. Um, uh, we've got a sort of maturing estate with, with, um, with partners. Uh, and uh, we're not seeing, uh, we're seeing good um, robustness and quality, and therefore it's allowed us to release some of the prior warranty provision uh, in the year. Um, in terms of the retur returns on cash, yeah, it's a good question. We had uh, actually, um, you know, the, the um, market returns have much improved. Uh, we ensure that we're getting the balance of whilst maintaining um, rigor in our uh, in investment counterparty quality. So we're not investing in any any uh, money market funds or deposits unless they've got very high investment grades, but, but also getting suitable returns and actually um, the finance income on a P&L basis more than uh, doubled in the year or approximately doubled in the year. So from 2.8 million in 22 to about 7 million pounds in 23. So the average interest rate we're getting currently is about 5% across the different uh, funds and, and bank deposits. Um, and uh, at the moment, we're expecting similar similar returns uh, at the moment and going forward, obviously difficult to predict and some of the yield curves are coming down a little bit, but obviously the balance is declining. So the finance income this year will be somewhat less than that, but still around 5 million. Thanks, uh, Nick Walker from Peel Hunt. Um, two questions, um, the first one is, more of a bit of a sort of size, scope, and perceptional question. Uh, second one is going to relate to uh, competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other solid oxide uh, electrolyzer companies in the market. Um, obviously, when the share price started to fall, obviously market-related also, granted, but it was sort of as the opportunity for the Weishai Bosch deal seemed to sort of evaporate, obviously got delayed over a number of months, perhaps over a year or so. And then you announced obviously the Weishai, sorry, the Delta deal, we saw a big spike momentarily in the share price. So from a sort of market's perceptional point of view, do you think that the um, opportunity set that you have now with Delta, given obviously it's a SOEC and FC uh, and obviously their breadth globally is, is enormous in terms of customer base, et cetera, is equivalent to 
what the Wei Chai Bosch opportunity in China might have been. So in terms of the market's view of sort of China, you know, Wei Chai being a leading player, switching from obviously combustion to uh, into fuel cells with Bosch, obviously a very established company in China itself for many, many years, having worked with Wei Chai for a long time as well. That obviously perceived as a huge opportunity, China going to be the biggest market for sure for hydrogen globally uh, long term. Do you think that the market thinks the Delta opportunity is as big and therefore in terms of the share price performance and sort of, you know, uh, perception of that opportunity is equivalent or, or, or not? That's the first question. Um, so, so is it in reality, actually, I guess it's a question, but also in perception wise. Um, the second question is, you mentioned on the EC side, um, key opportunities that you see ahead of you, green steel, ammonia, uh, green fuels, aviation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm interested for you to sort of explain a bit more um, about whether the, the, your commercial customers and potential customers in the future have a fundamentally uh, solid appreciation of your competitiveness, given that you're kind of an intermediate fuel cell uh, technology. Uh, as you outlined there earlier, relative to people like Bloom, Sunfire, Elkagen, and you know, there's quite a few others, obviously, um, in the solid oxide fuel cells. Oh, sorry, electrolyzer space now. Okay. And therefore, your competitive positioning going forward as you access or enter into partnerships, who can access those green steel, green ammonia markets in the future? Okay. Um, to answer the the first question, I I would say that the market doesn't recognize the value of the Delta deal clearly because I don't think we've seen, you know, we, I think it's frustrating from a share price performance over the past 20, uh, year of 2023. Despite what the company's done, there's obviously macro environments and also, you know, some, some disappointments around the, the China JV. I think, though, where there's probably an over, an over bearish sentiment there is um, the fact that we can't, we couldn't get over the line. A, Let's face it. Probably was a bit of a mega deal with with two two very large organisations. Doesn't mean that our opportunity in China has evaporated. And I think that's what the the disappointing thing for me is. I think the market thinks that that's gone away, and it hasn't. Uh, as, so I think that we will progress um, with our with our partners in a different way. So um, I don't think it's a like for like substitution. Um, I also don't think yet that people appreciate the value of these additional partnerships as we form them. But I think that hopefully, um, as we st start to see maybe interest rates fall and a, uh, an appetite increasing for these kind of uh, te technology businesses which have future cash flows, I think the foundational piece of, of these world-class partnerships that we're building and are additive, hopefully will we'll get its reward. So long answer, but near term we we saw a you know a spike in the share price but it didn't it dissipated with the just the headwinds i think that we see before us uh and i think the the future in terms of the uh the market for china and asia remains unchanged and i also think that we'll be able to prosecute that market anyway so i think that's what i would i would say there in terms of the um second question about our positioning versus competition. I think there's two, two aspects to our positioning versus competition. Um, one is, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we think that we have a big advantage on technology. Um, we're a third generation technology. We are lower temperature and not using some of these hard to source rare earth materials as our competitors do. And, and also from ease of manufacture and ease of system um, design and cost, et cetera, all of that is favorable to the Ceres technology. That's on a pure technology to technology play. Actually, probably one of our biggest advantages competitively is our ability to actually local, enable localization of manufacturing. So right now, if you are in the hydrogen value chain, you have a choice, which is, do you want to buy from a European or an American type supplier? And when you're running big national policies and you're actually wanting to secure value uh, in, in region, um, you have to localize and capture some of that value yourselves in the supply chain. 
the only company right now in this space that offers that ability is Ceres. So if you want to actually not have to import Western technology, but actually be able to manufacture it yourselves, that's where we have a very compelling offer. And I think that's, that is a differentiator that, that you know, our partners really are looking for. So I think, first of all, we win on technology, but also we win on our business model as well. Thanks. Hi, uh, James Carmichael from Berenberg. Um, just one quick one, just on the uh, the Bosch and Linda uh, agreement on EC. I guess um, originally that was sort of a, a two-year agreement um, announced just over a year ago, but at the same time it's maybe evolved from the original one megawatt demonstrator into the five megawatt module. So just wondering if the timeline is still valid. Should, you know, when should we when should we sort of start to think about um, potential outcomes, products, um, what, what, whatever it might be from that agreement? Yeah. Um, I think what we can say on that is given the strategic nature of our relationship with Bosch and also um, what we've already done with the demonstration from Shell, we always wanted to set up that relationship with Bosch and Linde as, as an early um, evaluation and a, a more collaborative development point rather than, an, you know, Shell is more of an end user. So very much interested in the economics of the technology and wanted to pull that technology. Whereas uh, with Bosch and Linde, they're more uh, involved in the value chain itself side, side of things. So going from proof, proof of technology at a megawatt scale, what we're now developing, as I mentioned, is larger modules. And really, we want to have a closer involvement with our, our, our strategic partners on that. So that's why the relationship with Bosch and Linde may be somewhat different from some of the end user relationships. In terms of time frame, et cetera, um, it's, it's not dissimilar, uh, but what we're doing is actually, we're not going to, our intention is not to just repeat what we're, we've done on this first megawatt scale demonstrator, it's actually to jump to the next generation of that because that's, from our maximum learning and value creation, that, that makes sense for Sarah. We don't want to just repeat what we've done on several times over on megawatt scale when we already have plans for the scale up of those modules. That's great. Is there any more questions from the room at all? No, if not, maybe Elizabeth. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I just added a follow up on um, the cash burn being at uh, its peak in 2022 and coming down from here, which is obviously encouraging to hear. But um, on R&D, is there any sort of uh, top threshold where actually that's, you know, you're, you're hitting a peak in R&D? Obviously, the SOEC is going on right now. Should we anticipate that when once we do get those larger modules, actually R&D could pot potentially come down in terms of intensity, um, helping that cash burn uh, outlook? Yeah, yes, potentially, yes, next year. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we expect overall operating costs, including R&D, to be at a similar level this year to last year. Uh, and that's the ongoing investment, particularly in SOEC and the stack array module we talked about, um, which sort of take, is a project that takes over from the, the one megawatt demonstrator, which was a significant component previously. Uh, obviously, a lot of a development that's ongoing, but in terms of large one-off projects, that's an example it tails off next year. So I anticipate R&D has effectively reached its plateau and actually could, with a cautious given guidance, you know, over a year out, but it could come down next year. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, I don't know if there's anything online there that you've seen from- Yeah, uh, we've had um, quite a lot of questions online. So we'll come and come to a few now, um, uh, but we'll definitely answer all of them in the aftermath if we don't get to yours. Um, if I could come to Eric first, we've had a question around the engineering services element of our revenue streams and the utilization of engineers. So the question is, as the business grows, how does this change? Is there potential better margin from um, this revenue stream? And do we use subcontracted engineers? So, so um, the, um, yeah, the, the margin for engineering services, um, it's, we don't disclose specifically, but it's not, it's not bad. It's fairly healthy and we have um, it's important that we get, um, uh, we have um, coverage of our engineering team uh, and utilization of that team. So it's very much scaled to uh, the market and partner needs. Um, these are very specialist areas. Um, 
uh, and involved understanding um, scale up, manufacture, um, uh, the build out of factories and supporting system development. So uh, these, this is very much uh, an area that we have in-house engineering teams rather than uh, third parties. That's an important part of our, our model. It's also a lot of IP involved. Um, there are some situations where we use third parties. One example would be uh, that Phil mentioned earlier around using um, a uh, using Atkins and others to help with the development design of um, modules and systems where, where uh, we utilize expertise outside. But in terms of engineering services for partners, that's very much an in-house um, exercise. Great, and there's a question that's come through from Sky Landon at Redburn. He says, it sounds like DSAN will likely recognize royalty revenues in 2025. When do you expect Bosch to start recognizing, um, or when do we expect to start recognizing royalty revenues from Bosch rather? So, um, yeah, we've already um, guided um, that there's, whilst there's very good progress with having the uh, Bosch manufacturing facility for stacks, uh, moving towards uh, commissioning and industrialization, there's a parallel activity which involves system developments, including uh, meeting um, market specs and certification and development commercially. So that's taking longer. So um, we're not give, it, it's not really in our gift to give a forecast exactly when the first kind of commercial sale would be of a system that generates a royalty for us, uh, but we are not expected to be material in 2025 in terms of Bosch. Thanks, Eric. Um, and if I could come to you, Phil, um, question here just asking from our partnership strategy perspective, could you provide a bit of colour on the, the sort of regional um, strategy, how, how you see that evolving? So what we've been doing is um, building out the commercial focus regionally. So we have uh, we have commercial teams uh, now, obviously, here in the UK and Europe. Uh, we're building a footprint in the US. Um, and already we have a team in South Korea uh, hiring in Taiwan. Um, and obviously we have a, a team in China. So we tend to have coverage where, where the market focuses. Um, India as well, I didn't mention. We've now got a, a team on the ground in India. And the regional focus is very much based upon the market opportunities that we see. Um, all of those markets, I think, have a combination of a couple of things. Um, very active policy regimes, um, very supportive potentially for, for green hydrogen, uh, particularly for the, for the industrial decarbonization side of things. And the, the other thing, as I mentioned, that's quite compelling with Ceres is we're particularly attractive, I think, where there's ambition in regions to actually localize manufacturing and supply chain. So right now, I think our most active region, uh, I'm going to say Asia, but that's a, a very broad area covering uh, several, several of those markets that we talked about. Um, and also, obviously, we have strong partnerships in Europe already with, with Bosch, and we would like to have uh, established partners in, in the US. In terms of numbers of partners, um, what we're really trying to do is, is create partnerships with you know the strongest partners we can can have because we also expect partners not just to um, act in one territory we actually think that most of our partners want to be global uh, a good example of that is delta who obviously have operations globally or across asia people like bosch and dusan have operations obviously multinationally in china us etc so so our our commercial focus is having localized teams developing the in-region uh, commercial activity. But then once we actually establish these partners, we expect them to also be operating quite globally as well. Yeah, absolutely. And another question, just follow on from that. Can you speak to the opportunity that you see in future fuels, um, which geographies and partnerships will be targeted? I think that um, what we're seeing is um, it, it's quite a, quite a, a big question um green hydrogen is not the solution for decarbonization it's not a silver bullet and it's going to take some time before we really move away from fossil fuels so a lot of um companies 
are looking at alternatives, synthetic fuels, e-methanol, um, uh, methanation to, to uh, change the um, supply of, of gas in the systems, et cetera. So um, we've, we're focused on that with the end users because again, solid oxide in that particular application is quite compelling because, because of the opportunity for, for thermal integration. And if you think about how we're going to decarbonize heavy, heavy transportation, like shipping, like aviation, you're going to need these e-fuels, these, these synthetic fuels in the future. So, so that's, that's obviously something that we're seeing as a, as a, a pull in the market for this technology. Yeah, absolutely. And we've had quite a lot of questions around this topic. So as Phil mentioned, we will be doing a couple of um, uh, sessions in the summer just to go into a bit more detail with our programs on Atkins and, and with Shell. Um, but perhaps just to close out, Phil, um, on that, somebody asks sort of how quickly can we prosecute on this next phase of the five to 10 megawatt sort of SOE system? And, 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 and what do you think that's going to mean in terms of the overall strategy around green hydrogen? Yeah, so we're moving quite rapidly on that because the core stack technology um, is built upon the foundations we've already talked about. Um, so we tend to do major stack releases every one or two years. Uh, the next stack release will be electrolysis focused, uh, but based upon the same footprint and also the same manufacturing that we have uh, at Red Hill. So from a stack development side, um, we can move quite rapidly on that. Um, but then what we are putting um, effort into now is actually the modularization of that. So what we're calling stack array modules. And again, I think we will give a, a, a technology um, update on this because I think there's quite a lot to cover on this. But because of the modularity of this technology, we're not talking about a big leap in technology developments. You're actually talking about how do you deploy these modules in in bigger arrays uh, that, that, that can then be modularized into plants. So our, our intention on that is um, developing those stack array modules, um, I think designs by the end of this year and, and deployment by the end of next year. So it's, it's on a fairly fast track on our technology development plans. Phil, Eric, Elizabeth, thank you once again for updating investors this morning. Please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. I wish you all a very good morning.